I think we're live. <laughs> you can hear me. I can hear you. And then yeah. there were two. Bum, bum, bum. Four Hi. shall enter. Two shall leave. <laughs> Welcome to Momentous Live, episode 16. I'm Tristan Jutra, and to my... Damn it. Right? I'm, I'm William Silver. William Arthur Andrew Silver. Oh, I just, you're, I just you're toxic, toxic me. <laughs> <laughs> your mother's maiden name and your social insurance number. Um, yeah, so, hey, loyal viewers, moms at home, except not my mom. Um, long story. So you may have noticed there's only two of us. So Tasia Custodi, she's been busy learning Italian the last couple of weeks and will be continuing to do so for a little while. Uh, Gray was going to be here until he had a, a last minute emergency it came up. We wish him well. Hopefully uh, that is gets all taken care of. So that leaves you and me. We have no guests tonight. It's just Will and Tristan. It's just like the olden days, Will. Just the two of us. We can make it if we try. Just the okay. two of us. You and I. <laughs> I thought this was going to be a strictly no singing uh, <laughs> show, but so the question is who's Kenny Rogers and who's Dolly Parton? So oh, wow. this week, <laughs> we've got all sorts of fun stories as normal. Um, we, we're going to ponder the demise of antivirus pi pioneer, accused murderer, crypto shiller, and former presidential candidate John McAfee. We're going to colonize the galaxy with our alien observers, diagnose Apple accessory related gastrointestinal distress, learn how plastic waste can be delicious, and sift through other random tech, automotive, and entertainment news during this hot, weird week. And here in the Vancouver, BC area, it has indeed been hot and a little bit weird. At least it's a little cooler today. How's it been in your neck of the woods, though? Uh, well, you know, it's a little bit cooler. Um, my cats have turned from their solid to liquid states, as is their customary um, uh, occurrence in the summer. But yeah, my butt it's, is it's... turning to a liquid state. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's hotter than a morally compromised person in a religious uh, institution. You're sweating more than a whore in church? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I, I was trying to be, you know, dignified and, and, and you know, be politically correct and all that. Well, we're just, it's just, it's, we're just quoting Norm Macdonald and whoever he stole it from. So, yeah, yeah it's a, a little warm. Uh, thankfully, a little, a little cooler this week. We haven't had all the fans, all the AC on. But of course, while recording, we got to turn everything off. So, yeah. Bring on the swamp butt. Whoop, whoop. So, let's. Get to our stories now. I'm driving as well, so I wonder if we can, if Kirsten can once again figure out how to make this all work. Say, so Graham normally drives, so please yeah. stand by for content. Let's see. All right. So, Will, you can like fill the fill the void with some. Uh, some so what's so, supposed to concentrate with that? <laughs> All right, here. We, sorry, you're gonna say? Oh well, you were saying that the sort of the I guess hot off the presses to a certain extent is uh, John McAfee passed away. Um, there it is. Look, I even managed to bring it up. So you know, it's interesting. I learned some things. I'd mm -hmm. sort of, he'd fallen off my radar. I know he'd been on lots of people's radar, apparently, <laughs> for a while. Um, it is one of these stories, too. I mean, it, it, well, as we dive into it, I, you know, really want to hear what what your sort of understanding of him has been over the last little while. But, you know, I lost touch with him somewhat around the time where he, you know, was no longer part of his software company which he helped found uh, the pioneer in in antivirus software having read through a couple articles including this one that you've got up there man how have they not made a movie this guy yet i mean he is like yet <laughs> yeah six pounds of crazy in a four pound bag i mean there's all sorts of stuff four pound bag on. of cocaine just four clear. pound bag of cocaine yeah it, it reminds me of uh there oh man there was that movie about the game show host who thought he was like a CIA operative and he yeah, might have been. Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. Yeah, Confessions yeah. of a Dangerous Mind. It's like somewhat between that and like WikiLeaks 
mixed with Donald Trump. Like it's just all sorts of stuff put together. I mean, this is this could make a great movie or a crazy movie, anyways. But <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, it, it's kind of a crazy story. It's a sad story. What what's have you been following his story over the last few years? I mean, I'd sort of lost touch with him in the last decade or so. I have, I have a little bit, and not, you know, I've followed him on Twitter a bit, but just uh, so if, just to bring everyone up to speed, uh, John McAfee was the founder of you know, McAfee and the antivirus uh, software maker. Uh, he died in prison in Spain uh, today. This news broke just today, so we're bringing, bringing any breaking news. This was a late addition to the show. Um, after a Spanish court said he could be extradited to the U.S. on tax evasion charges. So he's been on the run from the uh, United States government for a number of years now, and he's been hiding out in Belize and other pla- and on boats and in other places. He was 75 years old, and his death was confirmed by his lawyers. They posted some stuff uh, online. And um, he, he, found, he founded McAfee in 94 and lost most of his fortune during the t- 2008 financial crisis. But he had, like, quite the uh, the wildlife beyond that. He made a lot of money uh, promoting various uh, cryptocurrencies. He was doing speaking gigs, uh, consulting, and uh, also so he did sell the rights to his life stories for a documentary. Oh. Now, where it got complicated is he tried to avoid taxes by using cryptocurrency and channeling money through bank accounts and you know, all sorts of uh, financial jiggery pokery. And uh, you know, one of the, and I also, I ran across some scheme that he was uh, involved with a number of years ago. There was one of these high yield uh, investment programs that uh, sprung up a couple of years ago in the, the crypto bubble of 2018. Mm-hmm. And he had lent his name uh, to this one group. They were doing this arbitraging thing where you could like buy and sell cryptos uh, on different exchanges and make money on the difference in prices. And they helped him set up the, uh, his own exchange with his name. It didn't end up really going anywhere. But uh, you, you got these folks who were kind of like on the edges of society and yeah. up to no, no no good. Now, one of the weird things is back in 2019 when you know, things uh, started getting a little, uh, a little um, elevated. Actually, no, I'll go back back to 2012. He was actually accused of of uh, murdering someone mm-hmm. uh, down in uh, Belize. Um, there's all sorts of. Uh, circumstantial evidence uh, around that and then he was you know he's been on the run for a, a while but back in 2019 when the u.s government's uh attempts to track him down really stepped up he made some public pro- pro- proclamations he even tweeted out saying uh fyi uh if if i if i'm not planning on like suiciding myself which is a strange way to put it uh, yeah. but he he uh, said, "Like if 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 I end up if it, if there's you hear reports that I committed suicide, I did not commit suicide." And what is being reported today is that it looks like it might be a suicide. So the question yeah. is, did he get whacked? He even had tattooed on his body uh, about you know, a couple of years ago that you know, and even started a different a, a new cryptocurrency called whacked. So let's, we'll, we'll show you the you scroll down. We'll show you the, the tattoo here. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's, he was claiming that he had information or was speaking out against the IRS or something um, and that they wanted him killed and that he would never kill himself. He, I mean, he also, I, one of the articles I read said that he was, you know, worth a hundred million and was down to about 5 million after the, the crisis in, in 2008, the financial crisis. Um, and then I guess that crypto scheme plot investment, whatever he was doing, he made something like 23 million and what didn't sort of pay any taxes on it. Um, so yeah, quite, quite the character. I don't know how not declaring 23 million, uh, means that the IRS wants to come after you and whack you because you say they're bad or something, but, um, well, apparently a couple of years ago, he also, he also claimed to know who the identity of satoshi nakamoto the creator of bitcoin and now some people are saying well because he's got that knowledge he needs to be eliminated as well i mean this is just rife uh with conspiracy uh fodder basically and and something i I think one of his last uh one of his last tweets was like a QAnon related tweet as well (laughs) just like tweeting out the letter uh the letter q let's just bring let's see if we can bring up mcafee's uh Man, man, like we needed yeah, more yeah. conspiracy theories. Yeah, and... exactly, right? And, no, that's Justin McAfee. That's someone else. 
Um, anyway, it's 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 a, it's a little nutty. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so do your do your own research, as they say. Do you think John McAfee was whacked? And you remember a few years ago, Randy Quaid was all about the Star Whackers, and he was on the run. like. Is there seriously? He a ran cabal? up here. He exactly. ran up here. I think he no, he was legit mentally ill though. Like yeah. he was diagnosed as well. You know, it, depending on what you believe, he was diagnosed as mentally ill, and he was off his medication. He certainly talks like someone who is mentally ill. The uh, the other thing is John McAfee was definitely tempting fate because when when they were promoting whacked the cryptocurrency, the imagery he used was of Hillary Clinton eating pizza again, which just like drives right into the whole Q oh, and pizza on game. pizza game yeah. conspiracies and all that. Like, oh boy, so I. Who knows? I mean, yeah. no, you don't like anyone to be passing away, no. especially you know, no matter whatever <laughs> the circumstances. You definitely don't like people uh, to be taking their own lives. And if anyone out there has ever had any uh, thoughts like that, please contact your local helplines because that is not a laughing matter whatsoever. But I think more details are still coming out on the, uh, the strange and <laughs> tale of John McAfee. Mm -hmm. Moving on to slightly more upbeat uh, news. How about, uh, I expect Keisha's not here for this, more on Clubhouse. Another Clubhouse competitor has yet emerged. We, we saw that um, the Twitter uh, launched uh, Twitter Spaces, and yeah. uh, now Spotify has something called Green Room, and Facebook has their, uh, they have two new audio products, live audio rooms and podcasts. So. You know, the, the Big Blue app is really uh, integrating all sorts of features into it. So they're hoping that people will subscribe to podcasts through Facebook. Please, God, no. But, uh, you know, the live audio rooms is like very similar to uh, Clubhouse functionality because everyone has to do everything. It's like we talked about a few weeks ago. Is Club yeah. Clubhouse a neat idea, but is it really a product or is it just a feature? You know, obviously, so many competitors have rolled out similar functionality very quickly. So I wonder if... Uh, Hopefully Clubhouse can get bought out soon before they become totally irrelevant. I mean, it, it, it's kind of strange because I feel like we went through a lot. I mean, you and I, we've been we've been through some stuff. We lived through some stuff. We've talked through some stuff. It feels like the 2000s, there was a lot of technologies that were bursting onto the scenes. Things like distribution of music and, and videos through things like iTunes, um, search engines, um, some social media, and it was all working itself out. It felt like some of that had sort of somewhat resolved itself. We had gone to, you know, fewer players. I mean, definitely with recently with Yahoo finally closing its doors, it felt like maybe some stuff was coming to some sort of resolution. But it seems like they're always fighting over the same things, right? So whether it's streaming services or whether it's Clubhouse or whether it's, chat rooms or messaging services there's always some sort of competitor it feels like to me always that it's it's better to use a product that's focusing on the services delivering right because part of the problem with facebook a number of years ago is it was trying to do too much there was games there was a bunch of other stuff i started using it less when i focused more on just communicating to my friends or family and sharing pictures and being part of groups. That's when I got more use out of Facebook personally and using, you know, things like Twitter just for communication and tweeting and news articles and that kind of stuff. You know, that's how I work now. I know not everyone works that way, but I kind of get annoyed when some sort of new service or some sort of new idea comes out and all the major players have to come up with something to try to stake their claim in it to to grow their market somewhat. So I kind of feel like if you're late to the game, it's probably not going to work. It's like here with TELUS versus Shaw, right? Like, yes, TELUS does phone and television cable, and Shaw does phone and cable. But, you know, in some ways, TELUS is always a little bit better at the phone, and Shaw is always a little bit better at the TV and the cable box. Um, it's like... They, they, they need to do both because they're competing against each other. But at the end of the day, it's still what service you pick. So I've kind of rambled on. What do, what do you think about that? Well, just on the Telus versus Shaw thing, <laughs> I'm with you. I used to tell us for phone and internet and Shaw for TV because apparently I'm bad with money and not taking advantage <laughs> of bundle prices. We're, we're but I like you know, to money. go with the best, best of breed for, for that kind yeah. of stuff. But when it comes to 
uh, you know, the social platforms and apps. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about Silicon Valley and startup culture is that there are always new ideas for, for apps and, and platforms coming up. And it's just a question of how much traction a new platform can gain before the the, the, the big dogs that are, you know, that, you know, like the Facebooks and the Googles of the world, how long it takes them to adapt such features. So we saw with Snapchat, so many features of Snapchat have been copied by Facebook and its subsidiary Instagram. Uh, we we saw it to uh, even several well, back in 2011. Google was trying to build the killer social platform by re- trying to replace Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter all in one go, but it didn't really work. It was it was yeah. just too unfocused, and a lot of people don't want necessarily want another social platform in their lives, and that's one of the challenges the apps like that this have. So then you get a breakout every once in a while like Snapchat has mentioned, but TikTok, nothing's been able to stop TikTok. I mean, they're saying they're over a billion users now. Mm. And you have YouTube shorts and you've got you know, Instagram reels and Facebook reels, but they don't seem to be making a dent. Now, it really depends on what market they're, tar- they're, they're going after. And if you can get people while they're young enough, they're still open to these new platforms and they're not already entrenched in something like Facebook. So, you know, we got to love the innovation and it's just a question of how much time you want to invest into any of these platforms, especially if you're a creator or a wannabe influencer to build your audience. And if the platform you've chosen <laughs> collapses, are, are you, is that audience portable enough to take elsewhere with you? Are you somehow getting people's email addresses so you have a newsletter and you can direct people to whatever you, that platform you happen to be uh, on? For example, Vine was, you know, mm-hmm. Was, was great a number of years ago, back 2014, 2015, got bought by Twitter, and then ironically was left to wither on the Vine. <laughs> and But a lot of people who broke out on Vine, a lot of comedians and musicians, who, people who mastered that short form, managed to transition onto Instagram, and more recently, TikTok, and have done okay for themselves. Not all of them, but a, a fair number of them have. So Well, the, the Paul brothers were famously started on Vine um, and they kind of grew to one of the powerhouses. Like some of that seems to- On YouTube, kinda, yeah. Lo- Logan, yeah. Logan Paul and Jake Paul and now they're yeah. boxing Evander Holyfield. Which one oh. of them boxed Evander Holyfield recently? Not Evander Holyfield. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, what's no. his name? Uh, Mayweather, Floyd yeah, Mayweather. Yeah, that's right, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Floyd Mayweather. So, and when he made like five or 10 million for that and Mayweather yeah. made like 50 million. <laughs> and apparently it's like a super few effort. Well, and here's the thing like, you know, I don't, I don't like them, but the point is I'm not supposed to like them. What they're basically like wrestling villains. The whole idea is that booze is good as a cheer, right? So they don't care if you don't like them, they're just going to do their own thing. And like, if you watch them, whether you hate them or love them, you're watching them and that's going to translate into the money, but that's a whole side point, but you're right. They, they were able to translate to YouTube. Many others, um, was it? Uh, Lily Singh is another one. I mean, some of these ones. And now she's got a TV show. Yeah, she got. Well, she, she just ended it, but yes, yeah, oh, she okay. did the the what used to be called the late late or last call. Um, I forgot what she called a little bit of late night or something. I think she, I, I have to be honest. I never watched it because it's too late. I tried. Oh uh, yeah, I stay up till like ten o'clock if I'm lucky. So and that was on at like two thirty in the morning. That's why you have dinner at four. That's why you have dinner at four at the buffet, right? Yes, exactly. The old yes. country kitchen. The old country kitchen. <laughs> but yeah, so if they were able to translate over to those sources, but that but that's my point too, is like some of these services, like you're better off using that platform, right? Like I use Instagram for very specific things. I actually like Instagram a lot. I use Twitter for very specific things. I wouldn't use Twitter functionality on Facebook just because it's all on Facebook and it's all at my fingertips. If Facebook isn't as doing it as well as Twitter, I'm not going to just do everything on Facebook. Like for me, that's a fallacy that for me, that's like a bad, I like their Mm -hmm. approach to it is bad. I'm not interested in that. I'll use Facebook for what I think it does well and what I can connect with other people. Right. I'm not going to, suddenly drive like that was the whole problem with google plus is that it was trying to get people off four different things i still like google still sort of creeps me out so tasia's not here so i can say this so <laughs> like what what for example i was logging into a google platform and it remembered a bunch of other stuff i'd done on other platforms i'm like whoa leave me alone <laughs> it's like I don't want watching. you to know everything about me. So, um, but yeah, you do because I do other things with your programs. So it, it, it's again, like, it's just too much. Like, let me choose. 
you know, do what you do well at and don't try to do everything. Yeah, and I guess it depends on the type of user because we have to remember Facebook is like, what, 2.6, 2.7 billion monthly active users. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those folks aren't the type to want to necessarily use multiple apps, multiple social platforms. They might not necessarily, you know, they're probably not on Twitter. They might not even be on Instagram. Uh, they might not be on, on TikTok and so on and so forth. So, you know, fa fa you know, Facebook is kind of like the, like the general store of social media. And so they keep adding these features just to keep people in the, in the, the blue app, as, as they call it. And by adding features like this to compete with podcasts and even adding podcasts, so because so because so because so because yes, apps that come with their phones, be it Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. So they're just trying to scoop up some of the the laggards or the you know the late adopters there. And you know, it's it's obviously something that's working for them. They've got to do everything they can, especially now that third party tracking has been hobbled on uh, on Apple devices. So uh, just a, just a very quick little rundown of some of the key creators and topics in Facebook's live audio rooms. Uh, Will, tell me if you recognize any of these people. Grammy-nominated electronic music artist Toki Monsta will discuss female excellence and overcoming obstacles. American football quarterback Russell Wilson will talk about how to train your mind like an elite athlete. Organizer, producer, independent journalist, and scholar activist Rosa Clemente will host a discussion around affirming blackness in the Latinx community. Hear what it's like to live the life of a professional esports player in a live audio room hosted by streamer, entertainer, and internet personality o Omar Eloff. And social entrepreneur Amanda Wynn will speak with fellow changemakers about pursuing justice and making progress in, in an extraordinarily polarized time. I don't know about you, Will, but uh, I haven't heard of any of these folks. Have you? So the quarterback, he's the quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks, Russell okay. Wilson. I've okay. heard of him. But uh, and which is funny because the the throw ball is my least favorite of the professional sports in North America. But somehow I've heard of him. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mistake. Sorry. I meant to do this. Me all the time. I meant, to, <laughs> I meant to do this. Yeah. So. Yeah, so again, they are maybe targeting a uh, you know different demographic. They're they're obviously casting a wide net there. Uh, maybe a, you know a newer generation of so of influencers, and then some from traditional places like uh, professional sports. So we'll see how it works out for them. Definitely, you know, maybe different than what you might find on Clubhouse, which still leans pretty heavily towards Silic Silicon uh, Valley venture capitalists, uh, tech entrepreneurs, and whatnot, along with a bunch of like uh, multi-level marketing grifters. <laughs> uh, next up, Tesla backs vision-only approach to autonomy using powerful supercomputer. So this story uh, is, is, is kind of relates to Tesla's approach to their uh, autonomous driving uh, initiatives. You know, uh, they've touted "quote unquote" autopilot for quite a while now, and you know, people have kind of pushed the envelope a little bit, let it do, it's not really autopilot, it's just its name. It's not anywhere near level two or three autonomy. I think level five is the highest level of autonomy. They're still working on it. But one of the differences uh, between Tesla and some of the others that have been researching autonomous driving um, is they don't use LiDAR, which have those little spinny thing on the uh, the top of cars. You see like the uh, some original um, cars in the, uh, X Prize competition probably 10 years ago or so, where most of the vehicles couldn't even finish the competition. And we've come so far. But LiDAR has a little spinny thing on the roof of a car. Tesla's previously had radar and cameras, but now going forward, they're going with only cameras. And the, the idea here is that uh, using the combination of cameras and their neural network software, they claim that that is the closest you're going to get to how humans actually uh, see the world and and process it. So that's the whole point behind uh, this this story here. Um, would you trust uh, in any kind of autopilot or autonomous driving um, software in a vehicle at this point? This is where, you know, I've, I've read a few things about the vision and the future of cars and the sort of pie in the sky, I should say, but it's, it's a very romantic vision of how things would be is that you know we don't drive cars anymore we sit in this car we don't care about the car that we call a car it comes to our house we jump in the car 
it drives us places it goes back to some central hub downtown or somewhere um and it parks in some sort of space efficiency parking lot where all the cars from the city go and all this kind of stuff. Like That's in downtown great. Tokyo? I just watched yeah. Tokyo Drift last night. Finally. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> and they had the, you know, the car come in the elevator. Oh, I love Tokyo. Right. By the way, we got to see we got to see Fast 9 or F9. <laughs> my, my wife and I are still catching up on the rest of them. You got you okay. and Gray sucked me into that whole franchise oh. a few years ago. I buy you a bunch of them. When, yes, when you, you first watched like yeah. five, I bought you like a couple of them. I can't remember what it <laughs> yeah, was. Yeah, I think we've got five and six, but we started the back in the beginning. So we've gone through one, two, and three. And now we're so realizing good. how screwed up the timeline is too. Yeah. We, we'll, we'll cover that some other time. <laughs> so talking about this ideal about, yeah. Yeah, about cars, yeah. I think there's a number of factors to get over there. And I, I've said this about it when I've, when I've you know, went and wa- watched someone talk about the future of transportation and blah, blah, blah. What one of the side points here is, first of all, you need to get humans away from caring about their car, which is going to be hard if you see how people pamper cars or their individual individual sort of identity is trapped in their car. So even ignore that whole part about not caring about your car. We are a long way away from cars driving around cities without people in them and then jumping in a car Jetson style and just sitting in the back and reading a magazine when it drives you to work. That is a long way away. I love that idea, but the problem is, if I'm being honest here, we are probably never gonna see that. That's gonna take a long time to get to that point. It's gonna take you know, 25, 50 years before we get to that point where that happens. You and I know there's a lot of early adopter stuff that has to be worked out. There has to be a lot of unfortunate fatalities. There has to be a lot of car accidents. There has to be a lot of problems. So I don't really love that I, in my life, I'm caught now where this technology hasn't already worked itself out. I'd, I'd love to live with the technology where cars are just zooming around autonomously and I can just jump in one and, and read a book or play an iPad game and go to work or whatever it is. So it sucks that I, we're at this moment where they haven't worked this out and we have to go through the early adopter phase of all of this, where we have to work out all the problems. We're basically troubleshooting all of this for the tech companies and the car companies trying to figure all of this out. So that's my feeling about it. And as I always say, you've probably heard me say this before, I love the idea of Star Trek transporters. Work out the technology. I'm not the first guy jumping on the pad, okay? I, I love the idea. I'm like the 10 millionth person to step on the pad. So. This technology has to work itself way out. Otherwise, get the, the F away from me because I don't want to be your tester. So <laughs> that's my feeling on the totally, whole matter. Totally here. So, you know, no one wants to hear Gen Xers complain about, uh, you know, how rough they've had it. But, you know, we're the generation that grew up half imperial and half metric. So we've suffered through that. And now we've got to suffer through not having fully autonomous cars yet. But kids being born today are going to have... Oh, oh boy, Bastards. the time, world's tiniest violin playing just for yeah. not only well, our really, generations, but the ones a couple before and after us. Like you said, it's going to be a couple of decades before we see that, except for maybe there, there may be dedicated you know, highways and or lanes for that kind of thing. But mm-hmm. it's the once you get to the chaotic city streets where there's construction and pedestrians and pigeons and cyclists, all sorts of things that it really can confuse the uh, autonomous uh, vehicle systems. Well, the other thing is like, I lived in Ottawa for a little while. They had, I mean, it took them like 40 years just to work out their light rail system and the dedicated highway for buses. Like how long is an, an autonomous vehicle highway or lane or whatever going to take for cities to work out? I mean, these things take a long time to sort out. Right. So we're not seeing this in the short term. This is long term. I love the idea. Again, just rewinding. Love the idea. I'm all on board. I'm not against autonomous cars. I love the idea of um, uh, of electric cars as well, if that's tied into this whole autonomous thing, which with Tesla it usually is. Um, I love that people are thinking this way about transportation and the environment and how to cut down uh, on waste, both of people you know people owning individual cars like i said before these sort of pods that you don't care about that just come to your house and drive you wherever you want to go and you don't have to do anything oh man that sounds like such a great world but i think it's going to take too long to get there. 
that's a great idea, but we're never going to see it. So you, you've touched on a couple of interesting uh, and important points there. One of them you, you mentioned earlier was about fatalities. There are going to be accidents. Now, the mm -hmm. problem is that most people have trouble digesting numbers uh, and, you know, and doing math. And there have been some fat fatalities with these like semi autonomous systems, largely due to human error, like humans not paying attention and whatnot, yeah. because you're not supposed to totally rely. It's one of those things until we get to 100% autonomous, there's that weird gray zone where people can't kind of just partly pay attention, it has to be an all or nothing kind of thing for, for it to really work. Um, because if people are just sort of half paying attention, they're not going to be able to grab the wheel and, and react in time. So that's why the automatic braking, the, you know, the, the lane control systems and stuff like that are going to have to get really good. But when you look at the stats on, per, on a per mile basis or per kilometer basis, where all the, all the testing is being done is that the accident rate is way lower. Mm. Now, to be fair, that probably includes a lot of like pretty simple routes, like a lot of highways and whatnot, may, might, maybe not so much city driving. So we've got to tease out details from the numbers there. But the idea is that not only are we reducing car ownership and hopefully uh, you know, being more environmentally friendly because you need to manufacture fewer cars and you, you can have uh, you know, more efficient routes, less traffic, et cetera, et cetera. But um, you get people into this... <clears throat> Uh, this this mode where it's safer because it's the you take, you're taking the human element out of things, right? Well, but the thing the, is, the computers have to be smarter and, and faster. Yeah. Well, and this is, I mean, I think part of the point of the article is that it's going to require a lot of computing, right? Like flops and flops. So and many like, flops. And, and we might not even be at the number of flops that we need. <laughs> All of the flops. Um but you bring up an interesting point too, because there's a lot of conversation a, a, about this as well. You, you mentioned, you know, taking out human error. Part of that is I like speeding, or I need to get there faster. What what is an autonomous yeah. car going to do about that? And and I agree with you. There's the human error involved, and if you can get these things to go, um, you know, follow the game plan that they're programmed to, that's great. But again, what about individual decisions? What about individuals? Um, are we then saying that you can't ever speed? I mean, it's the law, but right. people do anyways because they have control of the car. So what's going to happen with autonomous cars? I mean, this is, again, not talked about or, or brought out in, you know, for example, this utopian vision of just Jetson style jumping the back of the car and, and going off. Um, and also, I, I think there was some hubbub about this a couple of years ago when some programmers were talking about making the car make decisions about running people over or causing a car accident behind yeah. them. And the trolley so, problem. Yeah, the trolley problem. So, and and by the way, I know people hate to think about this. They actually train big rig drivers to think like this, not to slam on their brakes if someone runs right into their car, if they're going to jackknife and take out four other cars on oncoming okay. traffic. So these are real decisions that have to be made that aren't pretty decisions. And we have to, if we're really going to commit to this, then we have to let the cars follow their programming and like forget about things like speeding and and yeah. and stopping the grandma that falls in front of our car if it's going to cause six Coins. car. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Anyways, there's a lot to unpack there, but you know what I'm saying? It's like some of these decisions are the hard decisions that are part of this, and I'm not trying to minimize them. I'm just saying like. It's not as easy as the utopian vision of jumping in the back of the car and being able to go wherever you want. You know, it's like these things have to be worked out. These decisions have to be made. As a society, we have to be okay with no speeding and running over grandma and a bunch of other things. Like, uh, that's it just, just feels, of, it, yeah, it feels weirder when we're letting com computers or cars yes. make that decision as opposed but to humans. humans are to making able... those decisions first. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. here, this is why there was a real conversation about coders encoding that into the computer about not slamming on the brakes if there's cars behind do you know what i mean like things like this like you say the car is ultimately making the decision but people are allowing the car to make the decision and are talking about the decisions that the cars would make right and when asked about it a number of years ago this the ceo of daimler benz uh said you know they were going to prioritize the lives of their drivers 
everyone yeah. else is like, sorry, that's, you know, like, how could you sell a car if you promised otherwise? <laughs> right? Yeah. So there we being honest and pretty pragmatic about it. Uh, one last thing before we, we move on is the, also something you touched on was some people like to drive. And what yes. about the whole notion of the joy of driving? If you got to get to point A to point B, even if you don't want, you know, want to speed, what if you just yeah. want to be in control and, you know, feel, you know, the twists and turns on, you know, the sea sky highway or whatever it is. It, you know, some people want a more active experience as opposed to a passive one. You know, it's sure it's nice to be able to like play a game or read a book, but what if you actually enjoy driving? Just like yeah. some people really enjoy roasting their own coffee beans and then grinding their own coffee beans, basically taking 15 make, minutes to make a cup of coffee. Some of others of us just like to push a button and have it ready in a minute or two, yeah. <laughs> right? But, you know, should you deny the people who like to make their own coffees, like from yeah. A to Z, that experience? So, you know, but, you know, when, but, you know, when, but, you know, when, but, you know, when, from governments, then there's a question of what, what choice is left for people. So, uh, luckily, we've got a few decades to work this out. Anyway. Can, can, we, can I just add one last point sure. about this? Uh, we've also experienced some of this in my, my personal sort of experience um on web standards and things like that sometimes things are decisions are made by the World Wide web consortium or other parties which are not popular and obviously aren't as big as like these things with cars that impact everyone on a day-to-day -day basis but for example i mean things like flash were basically killed or abandoned because it just didn't fit with the long-term vision of an open source internet right so sometimes these hard decisions have to be made for the long term of a system actually working out so it's not like this is unique it's just that things with cars i guess like you say about car ownership about individualization about you know choosing the the priority of the driver over other people you know these are, are sort of got real world consequences unlike just killing off flash or something else like that so autonomous cars versus autonomous people. Yes. Uh, so one last thing after your last thing was okay. uh, was and how this kind of uh, came up in response. Uh, the whole Earth catalog actually questioned uh, Elon Musk on the whole decision to go strictly with cameras versus mm. uh, cameras and radar. And this is on the Model 3 and Model Y in the U.S. going forward. And Elon said, when radar and vision disagree, which one do you believe? Vision has, oops, sorry. Got to go back here. Vision has more, much more precision, so better to double down on vision than do sensor fusion. And sensor fusion is when they use multiple sensors, such as radar, cameras, possibly lidar as well. He's saying, I mean, basically, human beings cope just fine, just fine with only vision. Do we really need to complicate things and add to cost by adding radar? Mm -hmm. My takeaway from this is uh, I just want to think of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and uh, yeah, and Vision and Scarlet Witch. So yes, I I, 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 I saw vision. down on Vision. <laughs> I saw Vision right away. Yeah, <laughs> especially when it was capitalized. Yeah, Bond Vision. Anyhow, so that's where he's coming. So it'd be interesting to see. It's, I mean, that's a bet. He's making a bet on cameras only, and whereas other mm -hmm. car makers are making bets on you know, radar and or LIDAR, and sometimes in combination with cameras, doing this sensor fusion thing. So we'll see who wins. You know, there are lots of smart people working on this sort of stuff. So next up, wow, we talked a lot more about that than I was expecting. So next up, we got some, uh, this isn't necessarily something that we would normally uh, you know, cover in a momentous, given the, the nature of the brand, but believe it or not, there is a hot looking new Kia coming out. The 2022 Kia EV6 electric hatchback. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, you know, Kia, Motor Trend says Kia's foray into the electric car market is futuristic and familiar. So Kia is, you know, being a, 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 a sub-brand of, of Hyundai. Uh, mm -hmm. Hyundai owns, owns majority shore of Kia. They've been known for a while, you know, for the last what, 15 years since they've been around. Kind of like how when Hyundai started out in the mid 80s, as kind of an entry level, you know, Good value, but but maybe a little on the cheap side. But they yeah. continue to improve as as the years have gone on. They actually, I believe, hired um, former uh, designer from Audi 
to uh, to work on a number of their their vehicle design for the last uh, the last few years, and their de the designs have, have have shown they've even got a new logo, which they also mm -hmm. uh, is being applied to the new Kia Soul series that's coming out, and you can see it here. Mm -hmm. But uh, what Kia is not necessarily a brand that I would have considered As aside from maybe their electric offerings. They've really gone hard into electric with the Soul EV and the Nero EV, which shares some DNA with Hyundai's uh, Ionic line as well and they're continuing to uh you know flesh out their uh, their their ev offerings what do you think about this kia well and you're a beamer guy but would you ever consider yeah. a kia looks like this well my understanding i mean i'm i'm, I'm not the biggest gearhead but i i have followed cars and i i like cars and um you know a number of years ago my understanding that kia was making very good cars that they were as bang for your buck they were considered some of the best cars for the price and the reliability ratings are uh, like have been increasing over the years and they're one of the top yeah. reliable i'm not sure for which models but just overall i mean yeah i don't know how much you can trust that i'm not sure if that's like one year two year five year or so yeah. on because every every car has problems but i mean kia still has a bit of a a, a stain against it because you know they started off in the lower end mm. but i mean hyundai has largely escaped that i mean there's still not a toyota or a honda but you know they're holding yeah. their own. But is you know, how far are we away from Kia getting to that point? Yeah, and my my parents actually have a Hyundai, and they back in the eighties they had a Hyundai Pony. Uh, so I I'm somewhat familiar with the brand. Um, Eighty four percent but, rust. Yeah, and changing <laughs> fan belts and the electronics going out within uh, a couple months of buying the Pony. But the engine didn't die, and that was the important thing, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't so much about the cosmetics as it was about a functioning car. Now, having said that, I don't have a lot of experience with Kias. Um, this Kia looks really nice. It looks very futuristic. It's actually, uh, I'm not a big SUV guy either, if I have full disclosure, but for an SUV, I think it, it looks very nice. I love the new logo. It's a little bit hard to read, but I actually, I, <laughs> Just I, love, as well. <laughs> I love the font choice. I, I love the lines and the dynamic sort of features of it. And I think it fits in with the DNA of, of what this car is. So it seems to fit it quite well. Um, overall, there seems to be, this is an interesting entry. I mean, A, because of the, the new design and, and the looks very high quality and very futuristic, um, but, and also it's an electric car, but B, there seems to be a lot of high-end brands going into the SUV market. So I don't know if you've seen them rolling around, but there's there's a Lamborghini SUV. There's a Bentley SUV. So this is an interesting counterpoint to that. I think the Lamborghini, I've seen a couple of them. The Lamborghini SUV um, kind of looks like a mistake. Um, it looks a little bit like a Mazda in the front and like Blade Runner hit the back of it. Like it's, it's like, like a car mullet. <laughs> it's like a car mullet. Yeah. So, and, and then the other thing is for me also, it's like, who's buying this? Cause I know it's the brand. Is it just totally a potlatch or what? Because I, I mean, like the whole thing about Lamborghini is it's a sports car and it's a high performance sports car and it's an exotic sports car. What, what speaks to SUV? In 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 a Lamborghini, I can I can understand the Bentley a little bit more because that's like luxury and comfort and all this kind of stuff. But like Lamborghini is high performance sports car, that kind of thing to me. Now that's just somebody can explain it a little bit better. Oh, great great job coming up with a picture right away. Um, so you're but a, you are to me uh, honestly looking at at this thing, which I will call an abomination. This is my personal opinion, not that of momentous. Um, and I have seen them in person. I'd rather have a Kia if I'm being straight up honest here. I mean, like the, it makes more sense to me and I like the idea of an electric car and it, I'd rather do something like that than waste. Was this going to cost 300 grand? Um, so I'm just throwing out a number. I don't actually know, yeah, yeah. but what, what are your thoughts? Have you seen any of these luxury SUVs? Obviously we had the Porsche Cayenne before yeah. and, and what's your feeling? I just threw it out there. I chose the Kia. What would you choose? <laughs> well, it all, I mean, it, 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 in some ways it comes down to 
you know, the numbers and how they actually perform in the real world of the ones you mentioned, I would, I would probably have the most time of day for the, uh, the, the Porsche. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, this is still has a lot of the classic, uh, Porsche lines to them yeah. and, you know, reasonable quality. You're still going to have some, um, the, some, uh, issues in terms of the cost of maintenance, of course. Yeah. But if you go the EV route, like the poor, the Porsche T Taycan, uh, mm -hmm. lots of people are going for that instead of the Tesla because they have better fit and finish. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people prefer traditional uh, manual controls as opposed to everything on a giant screen and, and so on. So I think that if I had to go uh, uh, luxury SUV, and especially if it was an EV, it would be toward the uh, the Porsche line. But back to this yeah. Kia, e, uh, the, the EV6, some of the interesting specs here, the have a single motor um, version going all the way up to an all-wheel drive GT model that puts out 576 horsepower. Oof. Whoever thought you'd see that in a, uh, in, in a Kia SUV. Zero to 60 uh, miles per hour in as quick as 3.5 seconds. Uh, two different uh, battery uh, options. Um, so one standard and one long range. And uh, Kia is banking on people, most people opting for the, uh, the long range Bigger. battery. And three different sizes of wheels, 19, 20, and 21 mm -hmm. inch wheels, depending on trim. I honestly don't know why people go for the, like the stupid large wheels. It just makes for a rougher ride. And the aesthetics honestly aren't all that hot, but you know, different strokes for different folks. It's, it's unfortunate if you get locked into the larger wheels at the higher trim levels, because if you want higher trim levels for say the leather or sunroof and you know, yeah. heated back seats and cool front seats and all that kind of stuff, sometimes they lock you into the larger wheels, but yeah, no sometimes Sometimes I there's a whole nother thing and we won't mm -hmm. go into it too, too far. I have a whole problem with packages and the way some of them are broken down and things like that. So like you say, it probably would depend on the package setup. But you know, some some places that I've gone to try to buy a car, they're like, No, it it comes with this package. You can't buy it without the package. It's like, no, it's a package. And your website says, I could buy it without the package. I don't mm -hmm. want that package. Or you want everything in the package except like one thing or two things or something like that. So yeah. Anyways, it it, it definitely looks interesting, and I'd be, I'd be the smaller wheels as well, but the longer, bigger battery. Hey, maybe we should swing a momentous test drive of the uh, when when it comes out. Woo, so woo. speaking of packages, plastic waste can be transformed into vanilla flavoring. Researchers Woo. use microbes to convert plastic waste into the chemical additive of vanillin. So some people may not realize this, but a lot of vanilla flavor um, is is from synthetic vanillin. And vanillin is the primary component of vanilla bean uh, extract. So, <laughs> so there is a, a, a new study published in Green Chemistry saying that the mad scientists have figured out a way to upcycle plastic waste into this valuable industrial chemical because vanilla, uh, natural vanilla is super expensive. It's kind of a worldwide shortage of it mm -hmm. so you know if you want that signature sweet aroma and potent flavor now you can get it from your uh your recycled plastic what do you think will would you like a vanilla ice cream cone flavored from uh, maybe made from your old coat bottles uh, just don't tell me about it i'm fine with it um no i, I Look, here's the I, science I, right here on screen you can see. actually i'm i'm partly serious i'm fine with it just don't tell me about it i don't want to know um just don't I, give me cancer. Just don't give me cancer. Work out the technology. I don't want to be, you know, the first one on the transporter on this one either. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think some people are starting to wake up to the fact that we have a problem with recycling and that, um, sorry, I don't want to get a whole nother tangent, but um, we're here for. we need, I think the understanding in the general public is that recycling is better than it, it is. Um, and we are still working out how to more efficiently and better use recycled material. I think mm -hmm. people have a misunderstanding that every bottle that you recycle is directly recycled into another complete bottle, and that's a fallacy. Um, so the more that we can do, uh, the more of the animal we can use, uh, metaphorically, um, I'm all for, and just to be clear, I'm not against recycling. I'm actually really for recycling. The point is that recycling needs to be better and we need to get better at recycling. Um, so that's just my point. And if we have one more thing to use it for, that's great. And if we can use more, um, recycled material, more products, that's excellent. Cause right now we're not using enough of it. And the word is that, you know, a lot of recycled material is actually thrown out or not used in the right way or 
um, the energy used to recycle material, um, you know, is adding to the carbon footprint, all these things. So we still have a long way to go. We are nowhere near to, to really, you know, sorting this out. I know you have a lot of passionate views on this, Tristan. What, what are your thoughts about recycling well, in general and this vanilla concept <laughs> specifically? Well, I think anything to uh, make cheap vanilla Coke Zero for my good friend William Silver would be yes. uh, would be an asset to this planet. But yes. like you said, the, the the tricky part about recycling is that it's better than you know it's generally better than not recycling. Yes. But but the fact of the matter is, like some studies have shown that up to seventy seven percent of plastics that we think are we're recycling actually don't get recycled. Yeah. So initiatives like this are great because any any other types of uses you can find for them because you get this downward. A path for a lot of plastics where you can't, like you said, you can't take a bottle and then just refill it. Like a, back in the days when we used glass, sure, you could do that. You, they would yeah. they would sterilize the bottles and then refill them. But glass is much heavier more, and, more, and more expensive uh, and that's greater to the, the carbon footprint um, for the transportation and all that sort of stuff. So that's why we've gone to plastic because it's lighter and cheaper and so on. But you, once you're done with the plastic bottle, it gets shredded and downcycled. So this is they're calling this upcycling because you're putting, you're making something food grade, which is an up uh, an upgrade from simply packaging. So that's kind of an interesting twist. The, you know, and they're just using chemistry to do this. So are there other sorts of things that can be uh, that, re, that re, these types of plastics can be used for that mm. don't end up being downcycled, but it could actually be upcycled because there's only you know so many polyester clothes you can make with plastic bottles, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, so some, sometimes you can shred these things up and put them into asphalt and the roads, but there are only so many in industrial and commercial uses for downcycled plastic, especially when there are so many different types of plastic. And if you get mix them up, it, it degrades yeah. the whole works and so on. So I think this is promising. And with you know, you know science is always marching on, and if they can continue to find uh, innovative uh, uh, uses uh, for uh, for waste like this. That's great. The danger being that people get careless with their use of uh, of anything, yes. their consumption, because you know, the three R's is uh, yes. uh, is reduce, reuse, then recycle. Right. So let's yeah. focus on the the first two as much. Like if you know, that's why something like um, Soda Stream is great for making uh, fizzy water as opposed to you know buying bottled fizzy water or canned fizzy water, right? You can make your fizzy water at home and it's, it's, there's still, you still have to, you know, recharge, you get those cartridges, which get recharged and so on, but at least you're not just buying plastic bottles that are then getting reused or having a brittle water filter at home instead of buying bottled water. If you're concerned about the, the quality of water in your area, there's, there are ways um, that we can reduce these things. You know, bottled water still is important in some, for some purposes. Uh, there are, you know, especially disaster relief yeah. and, uh, you, know, you know, maybe like soccer games or what have you. Like there are some cases where not everyone is on the ball enough to be bringing their, their good old water bottle. And again, how many water bottles do you have in your cupboard, like for swag from events and conferences and whatnot too? I mean, that's a whole issue on its own. You look at uh, re reusable like cloth bags in grocery stores. Mm -hmm. That's all well and good. But how many of those have we accumulated? And they say it takes about 1500 uses of cloth bags to actually be worthwhile for all the energy and materials that go into them versus plastic bags. So none of these things are simple, right? So anyhow, well, bottom, bottom line is like, yeah, v vanilla from plastic bottles, let's do it. What's next? Yeah, I was just going to add to that quickly. Yeah. It, I, I'm, it, you probably hear me say a number of times, like I'm big on also, like you say, the reduce. And I think that's the thing that people forget. And some studies that have actually shown that because of recycling use, it's actually gone up. Um, because there's kind of this mental switch that's like, I recycle, so it's okay to use, or all this stuff is recycled anyway, so hey, I can use it. as much as I want. Yeah. So yeah, so that's like you say, you know, I use soda stream. I also buy Coke in bottles sometimes. So I mean, there's, a, again, right, because it's the about, homemade Coke is trash, even, even I actually get the homemade Coke. It's just to me, it's not as good. Right. But again, I, I balance it. Like I've added that in because I am trying to reduce, right? Yeah, so yeah. And there's also a convenience factor, but there's also, you know, you, you got to balance it out and it, it can't all be one or the other. So, and I never buy a bottle of water unless it's like an extreme circumstance, like I'm going to expire and it's super hot out and I'm in a foreign country or something like that. I would not buy a bottle of water. And I, usually I would 
you know, bring up my own bottle or something like that. But anyways, that's a, besides the point. So I agree with you. I think the idea is great, but I'll go back to the beginning and say, just don't tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to do it. <laughs> and how long is it going to take them to make like cherry flavor for yeah. cherry Coke? And then we'll go on to like orange flavor for orange vanilla Coke. Maybe mm -hmm. starting with vanilla and then we're moving through the flavors. Raspberry, cinnamon Coke's quite good too. Anyhow, yeah. so I wonder what the aliens who are watching our planet think of all this. Well, as we fill up our planet with plastic and we desperately try to make vanilla flavor. <laughs> <laughs> because news that came out this week uh, is that um, scientists have identified star systems where aliens could watch Earth. You know, of course, the galaxy is huge and there are billions of galaxies out there, each of them with billions of stars. So, yeah, but just because there are lots and lots of uh, solar systems and, and potentially inha inhabitable worlds out there and maybe occupied with intelligent life doesn't necessarily mean that they can see us. So this re uh, new research has determined exactly which star systems have been or will be in a position to spot Earth and mark it as a potential home to intelligent life worth investigating further or perhaps avoiding altogether. Will, do, I mean, this is good to know, but do we really want aliens to know where we are? Yeah, I mean... From the movies I've seen, it doesn't usually end well. Yeah, this, this is one of those leading things too. It's like, it it's, it brings up a lot of emotions and fears in people and, and it's an interesting read, but, you know, we don't really know anything. This is just, again, speculation. I mean, there's some science here. It's like, well, they could be watching us, but there's nothing to say that they are. Uh, it's nothing to say there is anything. Um, I'm all for aliens. It doesn't, you know. You're pro-alien? Uh, I'm pro-alien if they're listening. Um, so, uh, I, again, I, I mean, obviously, I'd, I want peaceful encounters with aliens, but... Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's it's interesting. Uh, I think there was also some stuff last year, wasn't there, about, uh, I can't even remember the story, but someone said that, you know, an asteroid that came by Earth was, was you know, artificially made or something like that. But again, I think that story was blown out of proportion yeah. to try to prove, oh, some super smart scientist is saying that aliens exist. It's like, no, he's just saying that it didn't come from here. Um or, you know, it's a foreign material that we're not aware of. Um, but, yeah, I think people are always desperate on alien news. Alien news seems to be strike a chord every once in a while. Just recently, wasn't there some videos that were released with people speculating about there being uh, alien objects that were being filmed? I mean, again, until we actually see E.T. touch someone on the face with his glowing hand, I mean, we don't we don't actually know yet. So... Are they, are the government forces and the new world order just softening us up for first contact with aliens? You, you have those uh, U.S. Navy uh, recordings that were re initially leaked a couple of years ago and then officially released. And there, no one's, you know, they're not saying aliens. They're just saying, we don't know what this is. And instead of saying UFOs, which is still kind of has the, the, the stink of like crazy person associated with them, they're calling them UAPs, you know, unidentified aerial phenomena. So yeah. some people believe that, oh, you know, the, the forces at play are just softening us up with these uh, dribs and drabs of news to uh, prepare us for some sort of revelation that would shake the earth to its core. Let's get through COVID first and then and then we'll get to the aliens. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, this is interesting because it's thinking about our place in the universe from a different perspective. It's not from our perspective, it's from the perspective of those who might be watching us. Like we've been scanning the skies looking for them, but which ones out there could actually see us? So it's an, another angle to the research, which is kind of interesting. It's unfortunate that Graham's not with us uh, this week to talk about this since he is doing his uh, studies uh, in this uh, this very realm uh, at, at the moment. So we're not gonna spend too, too much time uh, on this. There's another quick thing I wanted to uh, point out was there was another a simulation uh, done recently that said uh, that speculated that aliens wouldn't need warp drives to take over an entire galaxy, um, and that it would only take about a billion years to take over an entire galaxy, which is lots and lots and lots of solar systems. Of course, we get Fermi's paradox, which basically says that if there are so many billions of galaxies in the universe, each of which has billions of stars. And, you know, just doing the math, there should be lots and lots and lots of intelligent life. 
it's like, well, where is it? You know, yeah. are, are, are we actually alone or is there life out there? But then you think about how old the universe is. Maybe several civilizations who are anywhere near us have come and gone already. And we're just missing them, not just by space, but by time as well. Yeah. So, you know, it's it, it just the, the, the scale of the universe is actually being shrunk by this science, which is saying that if we had ships that could only, or, or if, it, us, if we or an alien race had ships that could, you know, say go, uh, you know, a, a fifth or a tenth the speed of light that they could, uh, you know, co colonize an entire galaxy in about a billion years, which is still like a mind bending amount of time to think about. But yeah. uh, a lot of it has to do with the clustering of inhabitable worlds near the center of the Milky Way galaxy and how a lot of these uh, stars or these galaxies, uh, a lot of the stars in the galaxy actually aren't as far apart. So if there's, um, so just you know, a little something to noodle on uh, while we're eating our lucky charms in the morning. Well, and and I, thank our lucky charms that they haven't found us or conquered well, us yet. The, and I obviously there's a lot of scary stuff, behind, you know, at the end of some of these investigations or theories or thoughts or or investigations. But I would also like to point out that I I think when we started getting away from the stars, uh, when we stopped. You know, focusing so much of the energy that we did in, say, the 60s and 70s and 80s in space travel. And obviously, there were problems in the world and North America and Canada and the US at the time. But I feel like we've become more insular and we've become more focused on our own problems and worried about our own politics and all the dynamics of the world. So, I think it's refreshing to maybe take an outside perspective on things again so some of this renewed exploration into space into our place in the universe and i know some of this research has been going on even still um i think it's refreshing it's it, it's nice to at least see what our, actually comes of it well let's not jump to the scary movie alien war of the world stuff just yet exactly <laughs> So fingers crossed that they're uh, they are there uh, out there and they're nearby that they are friendly because yeah War of the Worlds Independence Day etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, just a couple of things before we wrap up one there's this, we meant to get to this a couple of weeks ago and it kept getting bumped there is a fancy new face mask from Razor um, can you tell us about this one I think this was your uh, your story. Yeah, I mean, the, this was one of the things that was announced by, by Razor a few months back. Um, and what did Razor make normally? Oh, yeah. So uh, Razor, they're really known for their sort of premium um, mice uh, and other uh, devices mm -hmm. for, um, you know, uh, hardcore computer gamers, I think, in particular. So mice and keyboards for competitive gamers, you know, these... These mice have like weights and various variable features. The keyboards have various sort of LED and you know quick key um, shortcuts and things like that. They're also really known for their sort of premium gaming headsets, um, and so they're really known for I think premium products but niche products. Um, and this would sort of fit in there. Um, th this mask basically. I, when I first saw it, I thought it was a bit of a joke. Um, the way that they put out the presser about it at E3, so it was shown off. They were basically saying, no, we're really making it. It's serious. We're making it. Um, so basically, it's, it's you know, protective mask. It's going to be sort of uh, that's similar to the, was it N95 type of mask in terms of protection and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's got uh, a glass front or a plastic front, a see-through front, I should say, not actual see, glass. So you can see um, your mouth. So you can see your mouth, which is obviously something where, you know, I I was um, I was out the other day and I, I stupidly smiled at someone through a mask and like, oh yeah, they can't <laughs> see that I'm smiling. Because um, uh, anyways, it's a long story, I won't get into it. But uh, also this mask kind of looks cool. Uh, it lights up, it's got lighting features. Um, so they're trying to add a little um style and fashion it's very much within their brand now having said that it's not like they make masks or personal protective gear on a regular basis i think this is just part of 
seeing the way that society is changing and trying to make something cool that fits in with their product line, at least from an aesthetic point of view, not necessarily a functional point of view. It's got some serious fallout vibes going on there too. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. <Z's. laughs> um, and it looks like it's pretty heavily engineered. So it probably took a long time to uh, get to this point and just in time yeah. for people to stop wearing masks. So. No, no, exactly. And, and no, no actual details on uh, timelines or how much costs, no actual information except for we're making it for real, or at least that's what they released at, at uh, E3. So. so speaking of things that are supposedly real um, and have finally started to make it in the hands of reviewers, but only available for pre-order for regular folks at the moment, is the Rocky Robot. This app-controlled cap toy can live stream through its camera while you're away but it's expensive. And Wired recently had a review on this uh, puppy. Now we are both cat owners and I believe, you know, Gray and Teja are as well. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on this puppy there, Will? Um, I, I, so I've- uh, It's not a puppy, I, this robot, sorry. This Don't robot. Mix cats and dogs. It's a robot, um, not a puppy. I mean, I, I have to admit, I, I'm always curious about what my cats do when I'm not around. Now, having said that, I'm around a lot now, uh, but particularly like when I went to work and stuff, I'd be very interested about what my cats are doing. Um, but there's always this thing about, do you really want to set up cameras in your house that could, you know, that are obviously streaming all the time or, you know, could be accessed, you know, um, do you really want that in your house? So this is an interesting option, at least having a robot that's rolling around and, you know, you could put it in a corner where you're at home or something like that. But definitely the price is kind of uh, expensive for something that's just for funsy. I love the snack idea. That's yeah. great. It's got the built-in laser. It can dispense snacks for your cat. So it's not just a camera that roams around. It's actually a bit more interactive than that. And we all know that cats love lasers, but they love snacks yeah. even more. So uh, the review in Wired wasn't that uh, flattering. It was only 5 out of 10 because it's, it is expensive, which is understandable yeah. for a Gen 1 Product and a lot of R and D obviously went into this, but despite the mediocre reviews, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know you think especially if they people have to start leaving the house more. Yeah, I mean, I, hey, if someone was going to give me one, or if they had a tester, I'd definitely try it out. I'd be interested in it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's also like you said, I'm, at the point at this point doesn't make a lot of sense when we're still many of us are still working from home. Um, so I, I think this is more a product that came out at the wrong time as well, if you ask me. But I, I think there's some great ideas here. It just needs to come down in price and we need to be in a better place in the world where people are actually leaving the house. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, $250 US. I just, it just occurred to me, it kind of reminds me of an anglerfish with the, uh, the, 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 the weird little... Uh, yeah. yeah. Pro that, you know, hanging out at the top, but you, know, you just need some giant sharp teeth there. You know what also reminded me that that's great angler fish. Uh, I, I agree with you. The other thing it reminded me of, I don't know if you remember the snorkels, which were the Smurf ripoffs. Of oh, the, the snorks, yeah. Yeah, the snorks, yeah. yeah. So it reminds me a bit of that as well. But yours is probably a better uh, analogy than mine. <laughs> Uh, so put that on the Christmas list. Uh, maybe the version 2.0 will be a little uh, a little bit uh, better, maybe a little bit cheaper for, uh, uh, you know. Always version 2.0. Momentous <laughs> exactly. watchers never buy v V1. <laughs> exactly. Uh, speaking of anglerfish and uh, things that look edible, there's a story of... Uh, of a dude that accidentally swallowed one of his AirPods. Oh man! <laughs> and um, he, you know, shared on the Guardian UK. Uh, on the uh, doctor's screen was a cartoon clear X-ray image of my ribs. Parked between them was the unmistakable shape of the missing earphone. So basically, in this article, this guy it tells a story of the uh, of uh, you know, watching a movie and falling asleep. <laughs> And then uh, waking up to get some water, and he couldn't swallow properly. Um, and then hilarity ensues. So, yeah. <laughs> what's the moral of the story here? Well, uh, well, the moral of the story is don't buy AirPods. Oh, boo! <laughs> boo. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. No hate. No hate. No, I mean, like it, it's interesting here. These stories. I mean, this is probably the problem with you know technology and in general where there's 
you know, when it's so small, there's some great advantages to it, but at the same time, it can lead to other problems as well. I mean, we have uh, those fun earth magnets that kids were eating as well. I mean, there's all sorts of like cool things that it only takes one person to mess up kind of, kind of thing. Uh, I think I mentioned in one of our early streams, uh, I can't remember if it actually made it to air or not because we had a few sort of uh, test streams, but uh, there was these things called magic bands um, in Disney World, which basically you could you could scan to get into the park. They're starting to get rid of them. Uh, one of the things that someone had noted uh, a couple years ago that they started putting uh, on the back of magic bands, do not insert in body because people would actually uh, like, like opened up their skin and put magic bands in like the actual component to it. So um, yeah, technology is great. Just use it for intended purposes and try not to swallow your AirPod while you're sleeping, I guess. Well, I guess the moral of the story is like, yeah, don't fall asleep while wearing AirPods, but sometimes people yeah. will uh, put them in and listen to podcasts to help them fall asleep. Yeah, uh, I, I know people that, that do that. So there's the there's the danger there. Uh, but it's one of those things. It's not the AirPods fault. I remember when AirPods first came out, people were like, oh, they're so small, they're so easy to lose. It's like, well, maybe try and be careful of the thing you spent between 150 and 215 dollars on. Like, well, this it's is like also when you have a small wireless thing, that's the risk. There's no wires attached to it, and it's small, so you could lose it. I've like I've lost one before, uh, but that's just it just comes with the territory. So be careful. Uh, I couldn't also help but think that this is eventually going to lead to some warning label. I mean, it goes back to that. And I, I, I honestly don't want to, use. <laughs> yeah, and I don't want to get into this, but it, it pretty much, my thought on this all stems from that famous coffee case with McDonald's. And I, I you and I have talked about this before. I understand the story. If you do some research into it, it's not as ridiculous as it seems. But the point there is that because of that case, whether you, like the guy or, or person or not, um, it you know will always have that warning label on coffee. And I remember one time at university, I remember that there was in the bookstore there was this big glass shelf like full of pens all on it, and there's a sign that said "Do not lean on shelf." And in my head, I'm like, someone leaned on that shelf. <laughs> so exactly. it's just like exactly. anytime there's a warning label, there's a use case. I and you may not remember this story. One more example of this. We went to laser tag once, you and I, and actually Jamie, friend of the show, and his kids, and Dave, and a couple other people. And at the beginning, they're giving us this warning message, and the guy said, don't jump off the second floor. And I think I turned to Dave, and I'm like, someone jumped off the second floor of this place? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean... Uh, so I think a warning label, not for internal use, may be coming to an Airbud near you. <laughs> Just like why you have, uh, you know, it Sainsbury's nuts. It has a warning label: caution contains nuts. Yes. You got to keep the you know the the, law the lawyers busy. Exactly. <laughs> Two more things before we finally wrap. Uh, yeah. We are into. We are three episodes deep into the latest uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, TV series on Disney Plus called Loki. You're three episodes deep because episode three was released just today. Uh, we're only two episodes deep here, so no spoilers. But uh, what are your thoughts on uh, how they've done with this series so far, Will? I mean, I'm really enjoying it. Um, it definitely is is a bit different from the comic books, but I've always said that, you know, the MCU has become something different and I love where it's going and I love that it it is tied to the books, but very different. This is very different than mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff in the comic books. I think it's doing some great things. Um, it's probably my second favorite of the Marvel shows that have come out on Disney Plus um, and maybe coming close to my favorite. I will also say that once in a while I have to pinch myself a little bit because I don't feel that I'm actually watching Loki. I feel like I'm watching Doctor Who. It's the best season of Doctor Who in the last five years. This is the best Doctor Who. I love the new Doctor. I love the new companion. It's great. It does not feel like Marvel, but it's okay. I mean, Thor Ragnarok and and Guardians of the Galaxy were something completely different than some of the other Marvel movies like Ant-Man. Ant-Man's got a whole other comedic thing. Um, you know, Spider-Man's got a whole nother thing going on. Um, so we 
can do separate things or separate things can be done in the MCU, in the shows. And I think this is, again, WandaVision was very different. Um, Falcon and Winter Soldier was very sort of maybe traditional um, MCU movie. This, again, is quite different and feels like Doctor Who. This is Doctor Who to me. <laughs> and I, I've heard other people say that, and it's absolutely Doctor Who. Uh, what's your thoughts on it? Do you see any of that connection there at all? I totally get where you're coming from. And I think the advantage that Disney has with Disney Plus is that they can do these series of you know, eight or ten episodes and they're like extended movies with the production values that are there yeah. and they can explore different genres. It's not entirely dissimilar from what uh, Star the Star Trek franchises have been doing in the, over the last mm -hmm. few years. And it, you alienate some fans that way because some of them want, especially with Star Trek, they want a specific feel to Star Trek. They say, oh, this doesn't feel like Star Trek. Well, then you ask yourself, well, what if there was more to Star Trek than the series that we've seen so far? What if you had a Star Trek, uh, you know, more of a kick-ass adventure like Discovery's trying to be. And, you know, Discovery's not perfect. It's got issues. The production values are out of this world. What if you had a, a Star Trek drama? That's what Picard largely is. What if you had a Star Trek comedy? Well, that's what Star Trek Lower Decks animated feature mm -hmm. is. And there's been Star Trek animated shows before, back in the 70s, not a comedy, but still yeah. playing with the, the genre a little bit. So... I think this is wonderful that, you know, having this different palette to work with and this medium with Disney Plus to have these shows and they're decidedly different from what we saw in the Netflix Marvel offerings, which were produced yeah. by Marvel TV Studios and which has been basically shut down. Kevin Feige is in charge of the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe. So these new uh, TV shows are being done un under Marvel Studios now. So there's a lot more cohesion and everything is going to be canon now, whereas most of what happened on Netflix under Marvel TV is, uh, is being cut loose and not actually canon with maybe a couple of exceptions. And, uh, and that includes Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which was uh, on traditional uh, broadcast television on, on ABC, owned by Disney, but Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. isn't canon because they couldn't keep things synced up because there's different teams working on it, and that was really a shame. So Agent Coulson, spoiler alert, is actually dead in the MCU, even though he was alive in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this could be a two-hour-long conversation. I agree with you on all of that. Um, I, while there was points of Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Daredevil and a few of the other Netflix shows that I enjoyed or liked, um, I think it was deeply flawed in some ways because it wasn't under the same umbrella that there were conflicting personalities. That's a whole long story about the different people that were running various Marvel franchises and to have it all under Kevin Feige is great. It's too bad that we lose some of the good things about you know, the first couple seasons of, of Daredevil were good. Um, you know, I didn't watch all of The Punisher because I lost interest in the Netflix shows, but I heard that it was very good. Uh, I like that actor. I can't remember his name as Punisher. I think he's uh, a, a good casting of that character. And what I've seen of The Punisher was good. Um, but again, I lost interest because it wasn't connected enough. I lost interest in things like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because it kind of, wasn't connected enough. They had a couple of the initial, oh my God, things with the Inhumans and things like that. But then that led to a whole misadventure with a horrible Inhuman show because there was a fight over uh, X-Men and a fight between Kevin Feige and other personalities. Um, but in the end, uh, I think that's unfortunate, but we've had some really great shows and it's really expanded the universe with Disney Plus and with the offerings under sort of um, you know, uh, Kevin Feige's banner, uh, we're, we're looking at expanding and really having a cohesive universe. And that's really what we wanted when we first heard about these next shows and about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So I'm glad we got there. It's too bad that, that some great things happened that we have to pretend didn't. <laughs> exactly. And we stuck, we stuck it, uh, out with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. There were there were peaks and valleys, but overall, they wrap, I thought they wrapped it up uh, nicely. And like you said, it's too bad. Even though they did connect early on in the first or second season with mm -hmm. Captain America, Winter Soldier, yes. it just diverged from, from there. Uh, yeah. Just can you tell us what this video clip is that, that, uh, that we're sharing on screen here? This isn't... Uh, this is, is Loki-related, but there's more to it. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you all my secrets here. So one of the things that we like to do is we watch obviously 
uh, the new episodes of Loki. Um, but there's also a number of shows that break down episodes, talk about episodes. Um, it's sort of like, I don't know if you ever watched some of those, um, you know, the talking dead after the walking dead. Um, so it's a little bit like that, you know, um, speculation, talking about very shows. Uh, we do this for all sorts of things, uh, for movies. Screen Crush is the one that I'm showing that, or that I, I picked there. Uh, the other one that I'm a big fan of is New, is New Rock Stars. Um, it's another YouTube channel that talks about um, Marvel Universe uh, in particular. Um, they, they talk about some other things as well. Uh, what Culture is another good one if anyone's looking um, for some of this. They do everything. What Culture does video games. They do WWE wrestling. They do all sorts of things. So, um, yeah, if you ever want to know more about your favorite show or some of the behind-the-scenes stuff, I, I always, you know, listen to podcasts um, like Slash Film or uh, watch sort of little um, breakdowns, things like uh, um, New Rock Stars or Screen Crush. Everyone's got their own, I guess, but uh, those are two of the ones that I like. Are, are there any that you watch? Do you watch anything like this where it's breakdowns of shows or movies or anything like that? Generally, no. Uh, we And there's a reason. We, we record like a few minutes of Talking Dead um, when, it show, when it comes right after Walking Dead, mm -hmm. but I don't want to commit to a whole other hour. Like we spend enough time watching TV as it is. I don't want to spend more time watching TV about TV is, is yeah. our general rule because I would rather That's be great. watching more stuff that I'm like still trying to catch up on. Like we're still just season three of The Expanse right now, for example, and there's so many of the great shows. We haven't started War of the Worlds. We haven't uh, started... Um, Brave New World. We got Foundation starting on Apple TV Plus this fall. Mm. Uh, the, you know, of course, new season Ted Lasso is coming Ooh. up, and so on. So there's just like so much, and I feel bad watching TV because you know it's not that a productive thing to do. Uh, we should be making more of our own shows like this for, for what they're worth. Uh, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. But I'll add one counterpoint. Okay. Some of these okay. YouTube clips. This is where they get you. Mm -hmm. Some of them are only like five to 15 minutes long. Right. So right. it's not a full episode. It's not like watching another show. So yeah. I'll just put that little nugget in your brain, the little earworm. You don't yeah. have to watch these. Obviously, your choice. And I hear what you're saying. There's too much stuff. Every other day, someone's telling me to watch The Boys or something. And it's like, I only have so much time. We only have so many shows we can watch. And Cut down your you YouTube. Watch The Freaking Boys, Will. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what that's there's that other one on Apple Plus you want me to watch that's on my list. Uh, uh, Mythic Quest. Mythic Quest. So that's high on my list. Well, I'm I'm I Maybe might be getting it. a new iPad. Spoiler alert. So Ooh. if I do get Apple Plus free, I don't know if I do. I have to look into yeah. it. I'm so going to be all over that Ted Lasso. Yeah, but the thing is, is now they're changing it. So instead of a year free, you only get three months free because their their catalog is is bulking up now, and they don't need to give so much away anymore because they finally got some hits on their hands. So, um, oh look, my sister's calling me later. Um, okay. So <laughs> she doesn't uh, watch, apparently. <laughs> I should have. Yeah, exactly. Uh, she and most other people in the world. But uh, yeah. so we will continue. I will continue to rely on you for the the summaries. But there are a couple of shows that I do watch that aren't so much recaps, but they're more deep dives into certain aspects of shows. One of them is yeah. uh, Center Row, and yeah. another one is Every Frame a Painting, and another mm -hmm. one is Nerd Writer. Nerd Writer does a lot of other stuff too, including uh, including art. Um, but mm -hmm. some, he, does, he does movies sometimes as well. So those are those are three. But they well, tend can, to be a little more high concept as opposed to like episode by episode or movie by movie break. Can I throw out another one that's mm -hmm. actually a, a big favorite of my wife? And I, I just started listening to it. I like it. It's a podcast. Um, it's uh, We often listen to it when we're driving the car now. Um, it's called The Rewatchables with Bill Simmons. I don't know if you've heard of yeah. it. Um, mm -hmm. You've probably heard of Bill Simmons. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's it's really good where he just talks about great movies and why they're great and what the rewatchable scenes are in the movie. So like Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, so things like that. He keeps on uh, he keeps on teasing. It's like a, a running joke that they're going to do Boogie Nights sometime and that's going to be the ultimate rewatchable movie. <laughs> um, but speaking of podcasts, uh, The Incomparable is a great one. That's... Um, mm -hmm. Jason Snell, who is a longtime um, 
uh, Apple uh, follower and, and writer. He worked for Macworld magazine back in the day. He has a, uh, a, n- a number of podcasts, including uh, the names are escaping me at the moment, but uh, he has a website called Six Colors. But The Incomparable is a podcast network, and The Incomparable was also a show. And mm-hmm. they tackle movies, TV series. They occasionally do sci-fi books and, and more. Mm-hmm. So that's worth checking out, too. So we should gather our links afterwards, and we'll add them to the show notes in addition to our regular links. This is going to be a link-tastic. Woo. But with that in mind, I think, you know, we were wondering, oh, gee, there's only two of us. We're, it's not going to take us very long, and it's, like, longer than usual. How about that? Yeah, because um, we're good old friends, and we can't stop talking. <laughs> Somebody stop us. And, hey, we got to start getting into the theaters. We I saw my first uh, movie in a theater since last fall, last week. Uh, my wife and I went to see... What was it? Oh yeah, Godzilla vs. Kong. <laughs> oh, I'm jelly. I want to see that. It was it was fun. It was fun. It was uh, I think probably probably better than uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters. Um, I think I Godzilla, like Godzilla King of the Monsters. Uh, people really hated that movie. I actually liked it. I I think you know one of the things I often think is that you know monster movies don't necessarily translate well to North American audiences all the time. It's a bit more of a niche. Thing, I think sometimes people don't always get the point of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I will. But I thought the first Godzilla was done really well. King Kong, yeah. sorry, Kong Skull Island was done really well. Godzilla yeah. King of the Monsters, I thought maybe just wasn't quite up to those standards. Mm-hmm. And this one, I think, is somewhere in between. It was it, mm-hmm. it was fun. Uh, it's nice to see something on the big screen again because I haven't seen anything since last fall. But For um, sure. speaking of monsters, Tasia Custody. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we last week we talked about uh, we kind of teased a video that she was doing. She did a video on uh, Prime Day. And it's no point talking about it now because Prime Day in the U.S. was uh, yesterday and the day before. It didn't even come to Canada this year. It's been postponed what? for Canada. Thanks, COVID. But she did a video on that. Uh, so her next video isn't released for a day or two. But she does. Um, she she did mention recently that she's got a uh, podcast going now called Tech Talk Techie to Me, and the latest episode of that is all about uh, Branson, as in Richard Branson from uh, Virgin versus Jeff Bezos from Amazon and uh, Blue Origin, a new age space race. So what Tasia does in her podcast is basically break down stories, uh, te- you know, tech related stories you may may have heard about, and she really uh, gets them down to their essence and. Um, and describe some usually in between uh, 10, 10 or 15 minutes or so. Um, so mm. always a good listen. You can subscribe to her on Apple Podcasts, mm. Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Absolutely. And- they're, t- they're great. I, I, I mean, obviously we're highly biased, but I think it's a really great endeavor and great, uh, great content. Exactly. And if you want to find out more about Momentus, you can visit us at momentus.tv. Twitter.com slash Momentous TV, Facebook.com slash Momentous TV, Instagram.com slash Momentous dot TV. You can look us up on YouTube if you can find us. Good luck. <laughs> Someday we'll get a vanity URL. We need more subscribers. You know, we're Working still, on it. One subscriber. To, the way we get subscribers, we have to invite them into our show, and then maybe they'll subscribe. So it's going to be a long and slow process. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got a LinkedIn page, too, but not much there at the moment. i gotta got to do something about that, you know, for all our business, uh, momentous business yes. purposes. But uh, I'm Tristan Jutra. You are. I'm William Silver. Thanks so much. And if I can find the right button, we'll say goodbye, and we will see you next week.